I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to come down today uh, and discuss with us the digital forensics and incident response for PLCs. Uh, you may note that my cohort in crime, uh, Ken, is not here today. Uh, he was actually unable to make the trip down, and uh, so I will, be, I will be flying with this solo. Uh, that being said, I've actually got uh, considerable help here uh, sitting out in the audience. I have uh, Chris Sistrunk, who has performed numerous forensics uh, engagements. <laughs> so as we move through the presentation here, uh, one of the things I would like to note is if you do have any questions, feel free to go ahead and bring those up uh, during the course of the discussion. Uh, we would certainly uh, not at all try to discourage any type of interactive uh, uh, process during the conversation. Uh, there is a mic that is going around the room. So uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. They'll bring the mic, and we will discuss it. So with that, we will go ahead and get kicked off here. <clears throat> so digital forensics and incident response. <clears throat> As many of you may have noticed in a presentation that was actually done on Tuesday, Mandiant has developed a framework for digital forensics and incident response specific to PLCs and devices that are typically found in layer one of the Purdue model. One of the reasons behind focusing in this particular area is that through the course of numerous engagements, we have found that attempts to apply a lot of the IT processes to the actual PLCs and IEDs that exist at layer one do not always provide the desired results. So through this process, uh, we're going to look at uh, the device and tool identification, <clears throat> focusing on both the, the mutable and the immutable characteristics of the systems that are actually deployed and the tooling that you have. Uh, mutable being those things which can be changed that would be expected to change. So for example, if you are looking at firmware versions, software versions, uh, in some cases, you do have re-engineering of the systems, where in some cases, connections can actually change. In other cases, you're looking at immutable characteristics, things like the, the physical location of the device, the, well, actually saying that, that the physical location of the device is not, or is immutable is not, not totally correct, because we have, have actually seen devices and locations other than where they were shown on paper. And so that's one of the things that we actually look to address here. Also looking at OEM collaboration. And, and this is a particularly large area of interest when you are looking at DFIR for PLCs, because in many cases, the OEMs will actually have tools that they have developed in support of their engineering efforts. Those tools can often be leveraged to support the actual DFIR process. We'll be actually looking at some of the tools that are provided specifically for different devices and also for some of the operating systems running on those individual devices. You, we'll also be talking about the customer availability. So in some cases, you are looking at instances where the software may or may not actually be available to a customer. In those cases, you may actually have to bring the OEM in to assist with that type of effort. And then you also have tools that are generally available. Uh, I know for a fact that, that Mandiant has actually developed uh, several tools that we will identify during the course of our discussions here that are freely available uh, out of GitHub. We're also gonna be talking a little bit about data identification and collection. Uh, starting off with the inventory, uh, not to be one to argue with Dale's point that, that he made during the, the opening session on Monday, but from our perspective, especially when you're talking about DFIR, inventory is critical. And we'll be talking about some of the reasons that the inventory of not only the equipment itself, but also of the tooling is critical when you are doing DFIR. <clears throat> 
We will also be looking at some of the communications that are ongoing. So for example, you have the you know, HMI, you have local interfaces, you have remote connectivity. And one of the things that we have noted uh, across a number of engagements that we have had at Mandiant is that in some cases, <clears throat> the intention is for the device to only be remotely accessed. However, in practice, that is not always the case. And I will actually cite a couple of examples where we, where we have seen that. So as we begin to move through, <clears throat> looking at, did we miss one? No, okay. <clears throat> so we're looking at device and tool identification. So some of the, the key points that are, are very salient uh, to this discussion and the actual practice of DFIR is the function of doing structured record keeping and very clear and concise methods for communicating with different products. <clears throat> you want to perform asset inventory to identify the relevant devices. <clears throat> and it's very important that when you do this type of inventory, you actually do the physical walk downs on those. It, it is not at all uncommon for devices to either be mislabeled or to have been moved. In fact, we actually had one engagement where the identifier for the device that was given was something along the lines of CD-S47 colon A1, and that was the description of the device. With that type of description, it's not particularly easy, one, to identify what the device is, and two, to identify where the device is. So in that particular case, we worked with the SMEs, we went through their different diagrams, and what we noted in, in the course of that was that we found the rack where the equipment was actually located. However, the designation for 1A, where the device was supposed to be, was actually empty. And so in talking with the folks, we were trying to identify which device this was actually working with. And what we noted, it was actually down in, in uh, 5A, in location 5A. And the reason that they had moved it is because they didn't have cables that were long enough to support it. So, like I say, some of the some of the logic, some of the reasoning behind uh, these functions is is not always clear and apparent. So it's important to do those walk downs, have the accurate documentation, and to work with the SMEs. You also want to collaborate with the device owners and the internal teams. Uh, those of you who have, who have worked with me over the years are very familiar with a comment that I have especially when you're looking at ITOT integration, that in many cases the engineers who actually work out in the field have a mindset that cybersecurity is doing security to them rather than for them. And in, in some cases, you know, they have had things break during this process, and there may not necessarily be a lot of communication between the organization which is charged with cybersecurity and the organizations that are charged with actually working with the devices. Also for the asset owners, you want to be sure to, to speak with them directly. And in some cases, the asset owners are not actually the individuals who are functioning with a company. They may actually be vendors who manage that particular equipment. The equipment may only be leased. Uh, that is very common when you are working with equipment that is in the medical space. Uh, we've, we've actually had an engagement uh, about two years ago where we went out to a hospital. We were looking at a number of different devices that they had looking to do embedded testing. And on one particular device, they had approximately 1,000 units distributed across the hospital facility. And what we found was there was absolutely no record of the firmware versions on those different devices, any type of patching that had actually been done. And when we asked about that, the comment was, well, our vendor actually takes care of that for us. When we talked to the vendor, the vendor says to us, well, we don't actually keep records of that because we don't want to disclose the hospital's information. So they both had what they thought were very valid reasons for not having the information. But the bottom line is, it makes that type of engagement much more difficult. And so it's, it's a very key aspect of working through that. So in moving from the actual inventory, let's look at the tool identification. 
the OT and ICS devices uh, that may be in an environment will have certain software, certain capabilities that are typically used by the engineering teams that utilize and manage those devices. That software may actually be remote. In some cases, the data is actually sent back to another facility. And in many cases, the links between the actual PLCs and the devices is not specifically identified. You look at the software applications that, uh, that are utilized to connect to the devices. In some cases, those are strictly serial devices. <clears throat> you have to actually be physically present at the device to be able to access and to utilize that software. In some cases, the devices are only programmed <clears throat> via a local device, such as a, a laptop, or uh, in some cases, they will actually have a computer that they utilize to do the configurations. <clears throat> However, those devices are not always present <clears throat> when you're ready to do a DFIR. Similarly, the software which is running on those, the software which is used to configure <clears throat> that device is not actually present. And so those are things that you have to look at. In fact, we actually had one engagement, and we'll discuss it a little bit more in detail later, but in this particular engagement, we actually had a device which was configured with a laptop. <clears throat> that laptop was connected directly to a PLC. <clears throat> Another port on that laptop was actually connected to an internet uplink. <clears throat> and in that particular case, we actually had a <clears throat> hacker gain access to the laptop, and we could actually see on the laptop that this particular individual was manipulating <clears throat> screens on the PLC. So like I say, we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. <clears throat> so in some cases, like I say, the equipment may actually be removed for a valid reason. However, it's not going to help the DFIR process. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into the conversation. You're also looking for the documentation that, that is supporting <clears throat> the, the actual engagement. So as I had previously mentioned, you know, the locations of the equipment is very important, but the locations and access to the backup configurations is also very important. It's also important to note that in some cases, the repository for the actual configuration data is not going to be the same as the repository for the program, the logic program, which is actually running on the PLC. Those may actually be managed by two completely separate organizations, and they may be housed in two entirely different facilities. So that is part of the reason that we focus on the framework is to provide a level of guidance that you can utilize as you work through this process. Uh, similarly, you have uh, issues with credentials. You may not always have individuals on site who have <clears throat> sufficient credentials to access the equipment. Now, that may be <clears throat> directly connecting to the PLC. In other cases, it may be that they don't actually have access to the jump host, which is utilized to access that device. We have actually seen in, a, in at least one client site where they have gone to utilizing jump hosts even for local access to the device. <clears throat> this is providing them with, with two capabilities. One is non-repudiation for shared accounts. <clears throat> so they gain a benefit from that. They also gain the benefit of having very limited distribution of the actual credentials which are used to access the device. However, when you go into a incident response engagement in that type of environment, it takes a lot more planning and it takes a lot more resources to ensure that you have all of the individuals necessary to be there. Again, that is one of the reasons that you want to utilize the framework. It helps to provide guidance for gathering all of this information. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when you're looking at the framework, let's say for those of you who are at Daniel's presentation on Tuesday, this image is going to seem uh, rather familiar. <clears throat> like I say it's ver at very high level at, at this point. Obviously, there would be a lot more detail that you would want to capture. However, it is a very good starting point. So you identify the individual vendors. You identify specific assets. You identify software 
that is associated with those different assets. You're also looking at the physical communications. So for example, if it has serial port, if it has an ethernet port, those are the different types of accesses that you may actually have and that you would actually find in the repository of information. However, when you get into the field, what you actually see is going to be different. So instead of you know, just a name, what you're actually going to see is something like this. So you're actually going to be looking at, at these individual devices. Now, the reason that it is important, to, again, to do the walk downs is because when you look at a device like this, it's very important to ensure that you have the model number and the serial number for this device captured prior to the IR. And the reason that, that is important is because when you start looking at, say, for example, the serial port, you're not actually going to be able to access that serial port utilizing the software which is available to you. Now, one thing that you'll note about this software is if you look at the upper left-hand corner, very small print, uh, what you'll also see is that it is considered to be restricted. Now, that restriction means that the, the software is not fully operational. There are various types of licenses that would be provided with the software to be able to actually access and utilize different capabilities within that software. And we'll show that a little bit more. But you're also looking at the, the physical environment. So for example, you have this, you know, this five pin serial port. Well, on paper, when you say that, oh, okay, it's a serial interface, the vast majority of people are going to think, okay, well, it's a DB9 connector to a DB9 connector. You plug them in and you go, not a problem. Well, that is not the case. In this particular piece of equipment, you actually have a different type of cable. Other considerations that you have to look at when you're working through this is not only that it is a different type of cable, but the cable may actually have different versions, different wiring configurations based on the model number of the device that you're actually accessing. So this is another reason that it is very important to do the actual testing and have the equipment available or staged at least in a, in a closely available area to be able to actually look at these different types of interfaces and ensure that they actually work. When you're talking about the software, you want to ensure that you have the proper licensing for that software that would be required to work through the playbook that you have to manage the actual incident response process. Another advantage that you have in working through this process to ensure that the software and the hardware are both compliant and compatible is that that will help you as you work through the actual playbook. As you develop that playbook, you'll come across a lot of the, the little things, the gotchas, the, the thing that the, the person who has been there at the facility for 20 years, he's the only guy that knows this. Uh, you know, and in some cases that, that may sound like a platitude, but we've actually had that happen in an actual engagement. So for example, we actually had a cable that we utilized and we attempted to connect it to the device. However, the cable that the folks on site told us was correct was an eight pin ethernet cable. Problem was the device actually had a four, five pin ethernet connector. So they didn't match up. So they said, okay, well, we're gonna to have to get this other cable. So they went to the process to get the other cable, brought it in, hooked it up, still didn't work. So we were trying, we were going through that issue and one of the engineers there at the plant uh, actually came in and said, oh, by the way, that's, that's not actually going to work because that's not a dash four version of the cable. You, you have to have a dash four version of the cable. And it's like, okay, well, what's the difference between a dash four and a dash five? Well, there's an extra wire in it. So, you know, these type, this type of knowledge is only going to be acquired as you work with the individuals who are in the field with this equipment. So, as we're talking about uh, device and tool identification, I wanted to give a, a few high-level tips go along with this. So you want to store the documentation and the data in a secure format and at the site where it will actually be used or at a site from which it is easily retrievable. You want to be sure to update 
the IR procedures to include <clears throat> device data and backups. When you're talking about the backups, <clears throat> again, you are not just looking at the configuration <clears throat> of the device itself within the software. You're also looking at backups of the logic programs. And the importance of that we'll actually touch on here in just a few minutes. Uh, as I previously mentioned, you want to be sure to have the correct hardware and software on site for interoperability. You want to ensure that tooling is available for each of the hardware and software versions that are deployed. Uh, we have actually seen instances where the hardware for a particular device that is actually in the field is not present at the facility, it is no longer available from the manufacturer. So to acquire that, we actually had to go out on eBay to, to find a cable to make that connection. So ensuring that you have that type of equipment available, ensuring that you know, these things don't get thrown away when you're doing house cleaning are things that are definitely very important. You want to also incorporate the workflow into existing processes. <clears throat> this is of particular importance, again, when you are looking at not just the configuration, but also when you are planning for the actual engagement. <clears throat> so one of, the <clears throat> one of the tips that we will typically give when we are talking about that actually goes back to <clears throat> you know, Occam's razor. <clears throat> the idea being that you know, the simpler, the more simple that you can execute and function, the better off that you're going to be. So in moving through that, you look at three specific precepts that always need to be at the front of your mind when you're doing DFIR for PLCs and IEDs, any equipment really that lives at layer one of the Purdue model. The first being that your primary function is to ensure safety. Now that may be environmental safety, uh, safety against hazards for individuals, but that needs to be your primary consideration. Your second consideration is going to be, is the device secure? And when I'm talking about security, you're looking at, does the adversary still have access to this device? One of the reasons that is important is because if you, you pull a configuration, you look at it, you see that it has not changed, you go away, and then the attacker actually goes in and puts his <coughs> software or his configuration changes in place. So you always want to be sure that you're managing that. And so in doing that, you look at that from the perspective of for example, a lot of the, the courses that are out there today that really focus on DFIR for ICS. And we do make a definite distinction between DFIR for ICS and DFIR for PLCs because the, the processes in some cases are somewhat similar. However, if show of hands here, how many folks have ever attended an, a DFIR for ICS course either through SANS or Idaho National Labs. Okay, so there's actually a fair, a fair number of you. So if you think back to that course, how much of that course content was actually focused on network tools, data that you can collect from the network itself? Essentially, you're using the exact same tools in many cases as you're going to be using in an IT forensics type investigation. And this is, this is not a bad thing. I say this, is, this is something that is important because that's where you're going to find a lot of your logs for things that had happened. You're going to have the proxy devices which may actually do a PCAP for you and you'll be able to see what a remote attacker has actually done. However, when you are looking at devices at level one, in many cases that capability is going to be insufficient in many cases, the devices that live at layer one are not actually going to be sending logs to a SIM. I know that some of you have done extensive work in the area of trying to take those logs and drive those up to a SIM only to have the SIM actually reject the logs. <clears throat> 
in some cases, there has been a type of leveling which is attempted. Modify the log to a point where it can actually be accepted by the sim. <clears throat> that doesn't always work. Uh, I know that EPRI actually had a project on that a, a number of years ago where they were working with Rataflow to try and normalize the logs that are coming out of different devices <clears throat> so that they can actually be sent up to a sim. <clears throat> never, never really came to, uh, to fruition because there are just too many different types of devices that are out there. Those types of differences are one of the reasons that you need to be able to access the individual devices. Another reason that you need to be able to access those types of devices is the incident that I talked about earlier, where we actually had a vendor go out to a remote client site, <clears throat> put, set down a laptop, connect to a PLC, start making connections, they needed to download some software, and they did a direct connect to the internet. Now, this is a laptop with, is connected to the internet, no firewall, no AV, absolutely zero protections, none at all. And so when we, when we actually went into their, their site, you know, we noted that, oh, okay, the laptop actually isn't here anymore. And so we didn't have the tooling that was available to actually access the PLC. When we acquired the tooling from the, from the actual client, that tooling didn't work because the vendor was using a different version of the tooling to access the device. <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons that you really want to uh, incorporate the different workflows is to ensure that you have visibility into those types of environments. So when you're looking at the OEM collaboration, uh, you know, some, of the, some of the basic tips uh, when you're talking with the OEMs is uh, crucial for the DSI, DFIR process and the framework. The OEM support uh, is likely to be required in the event of a major incident. As we talked about, some of the tooling that they will actually provide <clears throat> may only be accessible to their test engineers. So they may actually have to send someone out on site to utilize that software because they don't provide it to anyone else. Uh, <clears throat> data gathering uh, is made easier with the support of the OEMs. Uh, as I had mentioned, they have, they have the tooling, they have the expertise. And <clears throat> in many cases, they actually have built-in capabilities that are not commonly known to the vendor or in some cases even to the responding organization. So as you're looking at you know, OT for ICS and the devices and the environment, looking at OEM collaboration, you want to preemptively identify the data that may be available on a particular device. And this is particularly important because the various types of data are going to give you different types of information which in some cases will be similar to what you would be able to acquire in an IT environment. So for example, the device may actually have logs that are available. However, those logs may require a certain type of software or a certain sequence of commands that may in some cases be very cryptic in order to recover those logs. Uh, similarly, as we'll discuss here in just a moment, there are capabilities uh, to do memory dumps that are built into the equipment that are not necessarily always known to the process engineers. Uh, they are very tightly held <clears throat> capabilities that the vendor does not typically make the clients aware of. <clears throat> and you also <clears throat> may need their guidance, in particular with the sequencing of some of the events that you actually work through. So for example, in some cases, there may be instances where you do a disconnect of, uh, of an ethernet connection. <clears throat> There's the possibility that actually removing that ethernet connection will actually cause certain processes to stop running. There are also instances where <clears throat> the attacker <clears throat> actually executed an exploit which <clears throat> performed a function that is very difficult to recover from. Uh, for example, when Indestroyer came out, there were a number of capabilities that that particular tool had. And one of the tests that we were actually able to witness, uh, actually was written by Mr. Ben Suter, 
where he was able to acquire the, in, the end destroyer code, <clears throat> place it into a lab environment, do some, a few modifications to the code, and send out a, specific, a specifically crafted packet <clears throat> to <clears throat> the devices that are out on the LAN. What was noted there was the, the actual crafted packet was sent to three different devices. Two of those devices, it had absolutely zero impact. However, that third device, it completely crashed, and it was a hard crash. The, the buttons on the front panel no longer functioned. The LED panels that you where you would read the status, completely blank. Ethernet connection wouldn't even respond to a pane. So when you have something like that, utilizing the vendor's understanding and the understanding of the individuals who are actually on site, what you might be able to do is actually acquire that information from a different device. So for example, if you have, and so for example, that particular device was a Cipertec. <clears throat> However, it was on the same land with a GE. Well, someone who is very familiar with the GE equipment might have a way for you to actually to look back through the Ethernet communications that had been going on with that device. And so from there, you're actually pulling the DFIR information, not from the device which was actually attacked, which, which saw the, the actual functional impact, but you might actually get it from a different PLC device that is on that network. So that's another reason why you want to be able to have information about those different devices and access to those OEMs. Now, in some cases, uh, with the hardware, you may also want to be able to acquire a replacement device for one that has crashed. The, the Cipertec uh, incident is, is actually very pertinent to this particular topic because what an engineer in the field is typically going to do when they see a device crash that hard is they're going to make the assumption, okay, this, this device is bad, it's completely blown up, and they're going to replace it. When they replace it, the exact same thing is going to happen again because the individual who is executing the attack still has access to that device. And so understanding that you know, even though you replace a device, it may not necessarily solve the problem. In some cases, in less severe cases, uh, other than the Cipertec, you may actually want to be able to maintain power on that device in order to collect additional information utilizing OEM tooling that can be brought in. So if you have the capability to do a hot switchover to another device, you know, certainly that would be an expected and uh, you know, it'd be a practical solution. However, if this is actually the result of an attacker on that hot switchover, they may now actually have access to that device as well. So these are the types of things that you need to work through as you're going through your playbook. It's one of the reasons that you want to be sure to have the SMEs in place and participating in the discussions that you have with respect to the DFIR for the PLCs. <clears throat> the OEMs can also provide uh, specific software that you may not necessarily have available, as I mentioned with the example on the Cipertec, it may not always be the OEM for the product which was actually attacked. It may actually be a different OEM who might be able to provide additional support. So having those good relations is very important. Another point along that same line is that when you try to make those connections with the OEM, you're going to have your best leverage when you're looking to purchase equipment from them. So have those discussions when you're talking to the vendor about actually buying their equipment. You're going to have their ear uh, very well tuned to the different things that you will have to say and the different things that you're actually looking to gain from them. Uh, in many cases, sales can give the nudge, nudge, wink, wink to the folks over in engineering to get that additional support. You know, they can bring them into the conversation because they have those connections and that familiarity. <clears throat> However, in some cases, if you do this after the fact, <clears throat> those engineers may be too busy 
to go out to the site and help you out unless that has been a prearranged agreement. So it's certainly something to think about. <clears throat> Very simple to-do to list uh, here with respect to the OEM collaboration. I've already touched on most of these points actually, so we'll go ahead and, and we will move through to talk about resources and tooling. <clears throat> so in many cases, the tooling that you will utilize may not actually be provided by the <clears throat> OEM. It may actually be provided by a third party. So for example, we have uh, several devices that utilize <clears throat> the, the QNX operating system. Well, QNX actually has a significant number of tools that are available and freely available that, that you can pull down from their website and that may be utilized. And so the, this is going back again to the inventory. So it's not just a matter of identifying the serial model, the no model number of the individual devices but you would also like to acquire what's typically called uh, an SBOM, a Software Bill of Materials, trying to identify the specific software which may be running on a particular device. This is not only important from the perspective of identifying additional tooling that could be used, but it's something that can also feed into your vulnerability management and your patch management capabilities and processes. So for example, if you're able to identify that they utilize a particular version of Apache and there are several CVEs for Apache out there, then you can look at, okay, well, does this really need to be patched? You may not be aware that your particular device is actually vulnerable to <clears throat> a particular exploit that is being used against a particular version of Apache. And so being able to utilize this and feed it into your vulnerability management system is a definite gain of this type of search. So getting that, that SBOM ahead of time, again, when you have that leverage, when you're talking to the sales folks, being sure that that type of information is included is going to be important. In addition to the what, what I would refer to as a second party, such as QNX, where you know, they actually have software which is available on the product and they provide additional tooling, you have the third parties. Uh, here we actually have an example of some coding that, uh, that Chris worked with uh, our, uh, our Flare team to develop, where we can actually go out to a D20 and do very specific memory dumps, uh, acquire different types of information from those devices. <clears throat> In some cases, <clears throat> the vendor will be very aware of this type of capability. In other cases, they may be completely unaware of this type of capability. And so <clears throat> this is where your, your connections with your third party organizations, some of the teams that actually manage the equipment is going to be very important. <clears throat> when you look at identifying the, the responders, you know, this is some of the things that you want to try to attain information on, ensuring that they have the capabilities to actually address, address vulnerabilities and specific known capabilities of attackers that are out in the field. So here we're actually going to uh, do a real quick walkthrough, just a real quick example of the use of one of the, the vendor tools to acquire some additional information. So what you'll note here, this is very similar to the tool that we identified earlier. And what you'll notice here is that it's, this is not actually a restricted version. This is actually a licensed version. So with this, you can actually uh, perform a number of operations that will allow you to compare <clears throat> the known good file with the file that you pull from a PLC. Going back to the precepts that we talked about earlier, is it safe, is it secure? You want to be able to identify any changes which have been undertaken 
on that device that is in the field. Very often, this is not a capability that your IT team is going to be able to provide to you. So as an engineer, as the individuals responsible for this equipment in the field, ensuring that not only you know, is it safe, is it secure, but is it functional, you're going to need this type of access. And you're going to need it at the site itself, not necessarily from a remote location. So for example, as you work through this, there we go. So here, we've already done the, the download, or excuse me, the upload from the suspected defect, uh, infected device. And so we're going to utilize this function on the, the PX Works tool, the PC Works tool, and we're going to do a compare. What you'll note here is that it actually provides you with a very clear indicator that there is a mismatch between the baseline version and the version that you actually pulled from the device. As you work down through here, you can actually see the specific coding section where that issue is found. And what it will actually show you is the specific variable, which in this case has actually been removed from the device. Now, in this particular case, this is something that uh, an unauthorized person uh, actually did. Uh, of course, this is in a test environment, of course. Uh, we, did, we did not do this on a live system. But what we have seen on a live system is after acquiring the correct software and the correct licenses, utilizing this type of capability, we were actually able to identify a number of changes that had been undertaken between the deployed device and the baseline. The caveat to that is that in subsequent conversations with the vendor, they actually confirmed that they had made these modifications, but had not actually gotten around to documenting those modifications. And so again, this is one of the things where you want to be sure to have those contact points. You need to have those conversations. Because had we not been able to acquire that information, you know, our response to the client was, okay, there is a difference on this device. It, you know, it, it has been modified. And so, you know, that, that definitely would have caused a different set of reactions from, from the client. They would have gone through a ex much more extensive process in trying to cleanse this device. Uh, even though it was, it was very much a one-off device, other devices were not impacted, uh, that was very clear through the course of the investigation. So in talking about the OEM collaboration tips, you know, we talk about the, you know, IR with the OEM, again, before the purchase is made. You know, these, these are some tips that you can take away, uh, things that you definitely want to have uh, in terms of considerations. Your OEM uh, likely support many different IRs, so they, you know, they're called in by other companies, so they're going to have a certain amount of experience with the IR that you're calling them to support. In some cases, they may be able to say, oh, yes, well, we know that if we go to this log and we look at this information, that will take us over here to look at this file, and then that file will give us a link to the location of the actual Ethernet address of the device which, was actually, which actually sent the packet. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've actually worked to that level, and they're able to identify those types of information. Also, understanding their response efforts and capabilities is very important. In some cases, you may be working with a vendor that no longer supports a particular type of device. In other words, it may, have, it may be end of life. However, within your particular deployment, it may still have 10 years left before you actually get around to, to replacing that device. And so they might be able to help you identify third-party resources that have additional background with those devices and can actually help you with it. But according to their own policies, they're not going to support an IR against the device because it is end of life. You know, that is a consideration for the equipment that you have out there. Also looking at the, the OEM for the third-party tools. 
is, is something that's important. In many cases, they will identify. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Chris talks with GE on, on a regular basis. GE is very well aware of the FireEye Mandiant tools that have been developed to support IR for a number of their products. And so, like I say, you know, with GE, and there are other organizations as well. So additional items to be um, very specific about. Um, information collected, uh, it is possible uh, to build or, en or enhance asset inventories. Now, there's, there's a caveat here, because in many cases you'll hear the software vendors, the, the folks who go out and collect this type of information for you, you know, they'll, they'll say that they can access you know, ICS devices, they can identify those devices based on communications that they see going across the individual lands. However, many of the devices that are actually deployed out at, at level one do not actually utilize land segments that are being monitored by that tooling. So that there again, that's very important to, to do your walk downs, to go through the actual deployment that you have and identify places where that type of tooling can help you, identify places where it cannot. In some cases, you, know, you may actually look to deploy that type of tooling because it has additional capabilities. For example, uh, Nozomi and, and Clarity have capabilities, you know, certainly with intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, but they also have certain capabilities when it comes to inventory identification. And so even though that is not necessarily a core function of the tooling that you're looking at there, it's a capability which you may be able to leverage to help you with the inventory management of those very low level devices. Also looking at the, the data identification and collection should follow the same standard practices that you utilize for IT forensics. You do not want to have completely separate processes that you work through. But again, the caveat to that is that in instances where the IT processes and procedures and tooling are not sufficient to support actual DFIR for devices at that very low level, the PLCs, the IEDs, the relay controllers, uh, you know, there you will actually have a certain amount of divergence as you work through that. So then we go to the data identification and collection. So here we're talking about digital data, but there's also considerations for physical data and also physical access. And, and I wanted to touch on those here before we get into the digital data. In a number of the engagements that Mandiant has had, we have had requirements to utilize specific PPE, personal protection equipment. We have had certain trainings and certifications that you have to go through in order to be able to actually access the client site. You know, these types of things should be identified, they should be uh, certainly documented, and they should be a part of the actual response process. Because some of these things take a, actually have a very long lead time, and in some cases, your incident responders may not be able to acquire the necessary certification. Uh, the perfect example of that is I know that, that both uh, you know, Chris and I have actually uh, done work out on oil rigs and on drill ships. One of the requirements for that is what they call a, a Bosiet Hewitt certification. Now that particular certification actually takes three days. For those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it includes uh, basic firefighting, evacuation from the facility, uh, different types of survival techniques that you actually have to go through, you know, how, how to get into a raft, how to get off of a raft. But then it also has some things that some incident responders simply will not want to do. So for example, when you're looking at the Hewitt, that, that's actually the, you know, if I get, get 
if I get this wrong, uh, correct me, Chris, but I believe it is helicopter underwater evacuation training. And in, in this particular type of engagement, they, they strap you into a helicopter, a simulator, they turn you upside down, they put you in underwater, and they tell you to get out. <laughs> so four years ago, when, when we went through this, wow, that was an adventure. <clears throat> Today, yeah, not so much. So you know, you're going to have instances where your incident responders, you know, they're just, they may not physically be able to do it. Now, even though I could, today I could probably still do the Hewitt, not that I would necessarily want to, point this out, but, <laughs> no. No. <laughs> but there are also things that go along with that, that uh, you know, for some folks it's, it's just easier than others. So for example, with the, you actually had to be able to uh, traverse a certain distance underwater using a compressed air breather. So I actually had much more trouble with that than I did with, with the helicopter escape. Helicopter escape, I breezed through that, no problem. <clears throat> but I couldn't keep, the, I couldn't keep the, the actual compressed air device in, so it kept coming out. So very, very unpleasant experience, not necessarily one that I would want to go through again. But your incident responders have to be able to do those types of things if that's the environment that they're going to go into. And it's very important to have that as part of the incident response process. Because, you know, like I said, I, you know, see some of the folks out here smiling and, and nodding their head, and it's kind of like, well, I'd like to try that. Well, you know, that's, that, that's a good thing, but be sure to go and be sure to get it before the incident response is required, because it takes several months to be able to set, to set up the class that you can actually attend. So these are types of, of information that, that you also need to be aware of. You know, like I say, it's not just the data collection, not just the digital data. So you're also looking at, when you do start looking at the digital data, you know, you're you looking at the, the previous steps that should help uh, provide methods uh, to access the data. <clears throat> a very good example of this would be a penetration test that, that Mandy and actually did. And one of the findings that we had in that particular test was that there's a device out in the field, rather far afield, which is providing information back <clears throat> utilizing an LTE connection. <clears throat> what we also found was that they were using a public IP address, a public facing IP address on that LTE device, which was accessible essentially to anyone who could actually ping that particular device. And so we were actually able to gain access to the interface utilizing that particular interface just over the internet. <clears throat> well, we had, you know, they, they shut that down immediately after we found it, but there was still an open question as to what they were actually utilizing that interface for. That question hasn't been answered yet. <clears throat> so in some cases, there may be <clears throat> potential hindrances to operations when you start identifying some of this digital data and <clears throat> there's the potential, like I say, when there is the potential to negatively impact operations, <clears throat> this is the, those are the instances where you need to be sure to have the SMEs available on hand to talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> using the inventories as a collection list for the different types of data is a very good starting point for, for the data collection process. However, as we talked about previously, not all of the equipment, not all of the assets from which you want to collect data are going to be in that inventory. And so that's one of the reasons to utilize the framework to ensure that you have a much broader view of the assets which may be included in that type of engagement. So examples of digital data that, that you may want to acquire, uh, you know, date and time, uh, you know, last known approved configuration, um, the OS version, the firmware version. Um, now these, these are of particular interest because in some cases you may have a process built into your playbook that is expecting capability that is provided from a particular firmware version. Well, if you update the firmware on that particular device, 
there may not necessarily be a connection between the incident response playbook and the configuration management system. So that's another area where you need to be sure to identify those types of links between the different repositories of information that you have, the different processes that you're going to undertake during a DFIR when you're looking at those very low-level devices. Uh, another example, uh, you know, when we're talking about the CPU and memory utilization, now, in, in many cases, you know, if you have a Windows box or a Linux box, this information is not necessarily particularly hard to acquire. In, in some devices, there may actually be very specific vendor uh, <clears throat> shell commands that you can utilize to, to acquire this information. But the reason that this capability is important is in a DFIR is because when you look at that CPU utilization, you're not only, you should be able to baseline that. So <clears throat> typical operations for a given device you know, should fall within a particular range. That should be documented. So for example, if it typically runs between uh, you know, 30 and 40 percent of capability, then that's, you know, that's something to be expected. That should be in your baseline. When a forensics investigator goes out and looks at that and they say, oh, well, this guy's running at 98 percent, then the, the indicator is that, okay, there's something else running on that device that is not expected. So that is definitely something that you want to be able to look at. Being able to identify running processes is, is also something that you want to be able to collect. On devices that utilize, for example, QNX, you know, even though it is not a vendor-specific tool, because it is running QNX, QNX provides capabilities for you to be able to find that information. Uh, similarly, if you're running a basic Linux kernel on an embedded device, you may actually have a shell where you can get in and identify that information. Now, there's also uh, you know, logs and diagnostic data, network traffic, memory dumps. There's also one that actually came up here very recently that is important to look at because there are actually two types of attacks that are associated with it. So, for example, looking at the shadow file and the password file that is existing on a Linux-based system. The reason that, that it's important to be able to pull those and to be able to look at those is to see if a user has actually been added to that. In most cases, I say the, you know, the, the rule of thumb is that, well, okay, they, they, don't, they didn't have access to it. There's no way that they could have actually been able to utilize it if they had that because it's in a locked room. You can't actually you know, get physical access to it, and so it's, it's not really a problem. However, what we have actually seen uh, recently is some of the testing where we have done uh, actually executed threat models against the supply chain. We have actually identified uh, a particular device where it is very easy to get root access to that device while it is in the supply chain. This is, this is through an open interface inside of the device. So basically you pull the cover, you plug in, you now have root access to that particular device. <clears throat> the attacker could actually insert a root user on that device. Uh, we actually did this as part of a test where we installed a root user. You box the device back up, you put it back together, and again, where you're, the comments about not being able to access the, the device because it is physically remote uh, really didn't hold up because what we were actually able to do is utilize the old cell phone within 30 feet of the device, actually, SSH into the device, use VI, the, the editor, which is built into the device, make the change on the device to where we changed our root user. We changed the name. So basically, we had root one, they had root. So we basically just swapped the names because the web interface would only allow the root user access to the, the high-level functions, the capabilities to reconfigure the device. However, in doing that, we were actually able to utilize our, the password that we defined for a root user, changed his name to root. We were actually able to utilize that to gain complete and total access to the device. And that was actually through the cell phone. <clears throat> 
So we, we weren't physically connected to the box. We used a tool called Termius to actually gain the SSH access to do the VI manipulation of the file. We then brought up the web interface and we had complete and total access to the box. And that, that attack would have a, could have occurred in the supply chain. Now that's, you know, some folks say, well, okay, you have to be within 30, 40 feet you know, of the device to be able to do that. <clears throat> However, that particular device also had an LTE interface on it. <clears throat> so as I had mentioned previously, when you're, when you're looking at that LTE capability, if that LTE has a public IP address and <clears throat> I said the attacker in the supply chain is able to identify that, they have a root user on your box, they have access to your box, they own you. So, <clears throat> yes, sir. How long did it take to actually execute? Yes. The, the, to execute, it took about <clears throat> 10 minutes. <clears throat> the, because the, once the root user was on there, the, the process of SSH into the box, very short, very quick, the process of using VI to change the root user name, very short, very quick, and, and that's the reason we used root and root one, is because all we had to do was pull the one out of one name and put the one into the other name, and then we had access. Uh, I said, via, utilizing VI on an iPhone, not always the easiest thing to do, but uh, using that technique, it didn't take very long. And then in that particular instance, we were not able to acquire access through the LTE interface <clears throat> simply because the vendor for that particular device <clears throat> did not have LTE functionality at the location in which we were working. Uh, however, as I'd mentioned with, with the other device where we did actually find an IP, we were able to get into it. You know, it is certainly a, a plausible scenario. So, like I said, that, that was one of the really fun ones. I want to like that one. So, <laughs> so uh, any other questions before we before we move on? I, I can't really see the folks back there. So, I have a loaded one, uh, and maybe you have a part of this. But when do you need to have access to the box? Like, you know, is there a time limit when you know that you have to have access to the box? Like, you know, is there a time limit when the, the shell in the embedded device, and you have to go, no, I'm gonna pull it from the hardware, like using direct access to the chip. Yes, okay, so that's, that's actually a very good, very good question because that is something that we have actually done on several recent engagements where we have, we have gone into the device and essentially pulled the cover off. Now, in, in those particular instances, because there were restrictions on utilizing the, the shell, and there were restrictions on physical damage to the device. We were actually able to identify a technique where you can take a, a chip clip and you could actually place it on the device. <clears throat> utilizing that, you can hardwire it into a programmer and you can actually pull the program from the device that way. So <clears throat> now in that particular instance, the information that we pulled was only log data. It, so that particular IC was only log data. Uh, we were not able to access the, the actual flash device because it was on the other side of the PC board and they had used compression fittings to hold the PC board onto the device because we were not allowed to do any physical damage to the device. We couldn't actually flip it over. However, being able to gain that type of information uh, is certainly plausible. With, with that type of technique, and we have done it on numerous occasions. Hi, Aslam from MITRE. Uh, quick question, you mentioned that uh, given the number of diverse uh, endpoint types in the ICS environment, um, the tools are very important in this whole process, DFIR process. Do you have a list of uh, you know, type of tools that would be desired also, does Mandiant provide uh, any kind of tools to assist the DFIR process? Uh, 
Yes, there are, there are definitely uh, <clears throat> tooling that, that we utilize to support the DFIR process. Uh, <clears throat> a few screens back, we were actually looking at the, <clears throat> you know, the listing of a few of the tools that we had actually provided uh, for public use. Uh, there are a number of other tools. Uh, so right now, the, the names just aren't popping into my head. Uh, it's certainly something that if, if you'd like to send me uh, an email about those types of tools, I'd be happy to respond and provide you with what I can find. Uh, in most cases, when I'm looking for those types of tools, I am loath to admit it, but I will admit it. Uh, I just go ask Chris. So, <laughs> so uh, he uh, he has he has a very uncanny memory. He he remembers all of these things. In fact, I was we were having a conversation the other day about the you know the issues with cabling and the potential for uh, you know the cables to have actually have a mismatch in the wiring. And he was actually giving me the pinout for a GE cable and the changes that they had made to make it proprietary that he had used years ago. And so, uh, like I said, Chris is definitely a, a, a resource that, that we lean on very heavily. Uh, but yeah, send me an email and I will definitely be able to get that information to you. So here we were talking about the you know, data collection, and it's very important to actually perform the data collection exercises. In some cases, bringing in you know, your IR responders if they're not in-house, if you utilize uh, you know, certain organizations under contract. Not only do these exercises provide the ability to you know, identify and test specific devices that are in the field, ensuring that you have the proper software you have the proper connectivity, but they also provide an opportunity to familiarize the IR responder with the environment in which these tests are going to be undertaken. And that is very important when you're trying to execute an IR engagement very quickly. It is particularly important when that type of IR engagement is being done <clears throat> On a, on a pipeline that is 35 miles from the nearest town and it is six degrees. So you know, like I said, you're not necessarily doing the test on that specific device, but having the, the learnings from those types of exercises is going to be very important. You wanna be sure to exercise the collection processes, the potential impacts of that process uh, for example, we had one, one instance where we were actually doing an engagement and they stood up a lab with, which the, with the actual configurations for the devices that were in the field because the, the worry was that we could have potentially uh, negatively impacted that system. Uh, and that worry was actually justified in that particular case because what we were actually able to do was we were able to actually insert a hub into the connection between the PLC and the HMI, we were able to collect the messages that were being sent down from the HMI. We were able to reverse engineer the protocol that was used, and that actually took less than a day. We were able to create a fake message which allowed us to modify a set point, generate the proper CRC that caused the device to accept it, and actually modify that set point. So we were able to not only demonstrate the capability of gaining access to the device for IR purposes, but we were also able to demonstrate the ability that an attacker would have to negatively impact that system, utilizing capabilities which are not monitored by the IDS. There were no logs, there were no, <clears throat> no alerts for that, there were no alarms. One of the things that we also noted was that the HMI that they were utilizing didn't tell them that the information that they pulled from the PLC had actually changed. So if they were not actually watching that specific screen, and that was one of maybe 80 screens, they, they would not know that that value had actually been modified. And so doing those types of exercises are actually very important, not only for the value that they add to the IR process, but also for ancillary information so that you can get out of that. 
So here, uh, as we had talked about the, 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 <clears throat> the different types of physical data, we've already talked about this uh, to a certain extent. So I will not go over this again. Uh, I will, however, mention, like I said, the PPE again. Like I said, we talked about the, the, the Bossiet and the Hewitt and those types of things. But there are also much simpler things which will actually keep you out of a site. So for example, uh, you're walking into a site with steel-toed steel boots that are uh, say green, green diamond certified. So that's puncture resistant. But if you're at a site up in Canada, if you don't have the Orange Omega on there, which is actually a, uh, a qualification for dissipation of electricity through the ground, they're not actually going to let you in the building. And it didn't matter that it wasn't a substation. It was their requirement. And so it was one of those things where you know you had to go out. And fortunately, they actually knew of a supplier that was only about 40 miles away. You know, drive out there, get, get, the right, uh, get the right shoes, and then you can get back in and you can start working on it. But uh, you know those types of things definitely need, be, need to be a consideration. We we constantly run into those types of issues. <clears throat> Again, here's a you know high level uh, <clears throat> look at some of the the physical data that uh, that you can look to collect. Uh, you know certainly these slides will be available. So if there's information you want to get out of here, and if there's additional information, additional insight that you would like. Uh, related to you know the collection of any of these types of information, if you'd like additional uh, information about some of the specific instances of equipment that we have seen, uh, some of the special techniques, some of the special care that we've had to go through, uh, you know certainly those are questions that we can answer. And as we work through this, uh, you know, I'd also like to note that we are in the process of revamping our uh, DFIR for PLCs class. Uh, that is a class which is specific to the PLCs. This is not, as we talked about earlier, this is not another you know, cybersecurity for ICS or digital forensics for ICS. This is specific to those level one type devices and a lot of the, the tools and the techniques that you would be able to utilize in that process. So as, as we revamp that, uh, you'll be seeing uh, additional co information coming out uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, current target is to have that ready for, uh, for execution again by the, the end of the fourth quarter. So with that, any other comments, questions? All right. Well, thank you all very much. I greatly appreciate it.